lead on very well from what a number of people have been saying today. But one essential theme that I have to say I think perhaps hasn't come out with sufficient force is that the supposed conflict between the historic built environment and sustainability is actually a myth. And I think it's worth going back to basics a moment and recapping how the built environment e developed, evolved in energy terms to see exactly why that is. Being a physicist, I tend to think naturally in terms of energy, and you need to put in lots of energy to construct and use um, buildings, energy to make and uh, exploit the raw materials, energy to get to the, them to the building site, energy to construct the building once you're there. And once it's up, you need to keep adding a bit more energy in for maintenance and for repair. And in most buildings, the occupants will also want to add in some energy to modify the natural conditions of the building, so heating, cooling, lighting, amongst other things. In fact, it's really useful to think of all of this in terms of what we've christened for the building, uh, Practical Building Conservation Series as the Building Performance Triangle. Current government policies tend to obsess about the fabric, which is, I think, how we got to the idea that there's somehow a conflict between old built environment and sustainability. But the people and the services are just as important if you're trying to figure out where the energy and carbon is going. Before the Industrial Revolution, energy was terribly expensive and terribly hard to get a hold of, so you really had to think about where it was coming from, and you were forced to ration what you used. And if we work through the inputs into a building constructed up until that time, that's really clear. Most of the materials were local, so you didn't need to factor in much by way of transport, which was, of course, and still is an enormous user of energy. Arguably, the main material was timber, where the energy inputs solar, and the growing was natural. There really weren't any serious uh, inputs of planting or clearing. I'm not sure how many of you know this marvelous book, but it gives a brilliant picture of the way forestry and timber and timber exploitation used to work, and it's very different to the way it works now. And it wasn't just trees, of course, that were exploited, but coppices and brush and reed and straw, all according to what was locally available. Earth was another material readily available, easy to use, used little energy other than sweat and sinew. Slime and stone did require a bit more energy and knowledge to exploit, but again, it was mostly sourced like locally from shallow delves, and you didn't have, uh, as if you didn't have a source of building stone nearby, you built of earth, or you built of earth and timber, or something that was locally available. Lime needed to be calcined, of course, which meant kilns that could reach temperatures of around 900 degrees, and firing those kilns was where most of the building energy went at that time. You know, and although you needed metal, metal was useful for things like nails and for moving parts like hinges, it took lots and lots of energy to exploit, so it was used very, very sparingly. You can melt some metals like lead and copper at fairly low temperatures, so those were the common metals. And they're resistant to corrosion as well, uh, which is very handy, but they aren't very resistant to wear and fatigue, and that's where the iron comes in. Unfortunately, the melting point of iron is over 1,500 degrees, and a technology capable of getting there didn't appear until the invention of the blast furnace, which really didn't get going in Europe until the late Middle Ages. Up until then, you produced iron in bloomeries, so once again, the main source of energy there was human toil. And for the Practical Building Conservation books, we put together brief histories of the materials and systems of the buildings. And I've come mentally to put the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, not where we usually put it, but in and around Liège at the end of the 15th century, where they also began making glass on a greater scale, as well as blast furnishes, fur and furnaces. And for glass, too, you need really high temperatures, 1,600 degrees or more. And I don't think it's an accident that those areas also had massive supplies of wood and coal and water, just as Andy was saying about the local uh, um, uh, industrial sites. This is also the time when brick starts to become popular because to fire clay well also needs high temperatures, 900 to 1200 degrees or more. Let's go back to iron though. With iron easier to make thanks to the aforesaid 
blast furnace, you could start producing the tools that could dig up more coal and more iron ore, and you could automate more processes, and crucially, you could develop the means to move it all around easily. This meant that centralized production became possible, and eventually it also allowed for the exploitation of even higher energy materials like silicon or aluminium, which is called liquid electricity, uh, solid electricity rather, for a very good reason. And so the snowball really started to roll down the hill, and it changed building practice completely, as Bob mentioned this morning. Not only did we start making structures entirely dependent on high energy materials like steel and cement and glass, but we also found more and more ways to funnel more energy into the buildings. And this led to a dislocation of source of energy and outcome use of energy that's really important. If you have to go out and collect your firewood and your water or make your rushlight or a small piece of glass costs a year's income, you find ways of using as little as possible. If it's all very, very easy, it seems human nature to try and use as much of it as possible and as quickly as possible. There's so much mission creep in all of this. The moment you can have water on tap, you want water in every room. The moment you have central heating, you turn the thermostat up. I was once teaching some Middle Eastern architecture students and they explained to me that they aimed for 24 degrees from the air conditioning in winter, but for 18 degrees in summer. So they're actually stretching those boundaries and using much more energy. It's also meant we see things in a more disposable fashion, of course, with replacement becoming the norm instead of maintenance. And we're not anything like as good as we used to be at reuse. The other thing, of course, that's been lost is skilled labor with an understanding of how a building was meant to function. And architecture and engineering has been centralized, too, with the result that we build exactly the same buildings all around the world, regardless of climate. And they leak in exactly the same way everywhere, too. So if you look at the energy going into a pre-industrial revolution building when energy was expensive and difficult to source, it goes something like this. And in presenting this to a group of building archaeologists, I, it's, I know it's a bit like teaching your grandmother to suck eggs, but I do have a purpose in doing so. Uh, there was the energy involved in getting the materials, so growing the trees and the thatch and scratch mining the limestone or clay. Everything was pretty much sourced locally, so t you kept transport at a minimum. The processing was local too, so perhaps calling on some skilled travelling masons or woodcutters, but largely relying on local schools, skills which were therefore well developed. And often the processing was done pretty much right next to the building site or on the building site, again, keeping transport to a minimum. The processing and construction were closely intertwined, in fact, which had a distinct advantage when it came to the next stage of a building's life, uh, which is the stage when you had to keep it going. Good maintenance was the way of preventing major repairs, but even repairs were made easy by the fact the building had been made with local materials and local skills, and they were both still available. This stage of the building's life also uses energy for lighting and heating and cooling and cooking. And in, again, in the past, this was all kept as, to a strict minimum. They had many tricks for doing that, which we could easily relearn and apply not just to our old buildings again, but could usefully adapt for modern building too. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. These buildings have survived through the Industrial Revolution because they've also been given various updatings to make them acceptable to the latest standards, adding plumbing and new forms of heating and eventually mains, gas and electricity. So that gives us, if you like, a picture of the whole energy, uh, whole life energy costs of the building. You've got the original construction costs, which are probably the biggest slice, all things considered. Then you've got the day-to-day -day maintenance, and finally the running and refurbishment energy costs, which are currently increasing all the time, of course. Now, I say whole life cycle, but what actually is that end point? When does the building actually cease to function and we have to start building again? Well, of course, we have the evidence all around us. We've got plenty of buildings with many hundreds of years old, which are still going strong with just that little day-to-day -day input of energy. Traditional materials and construction are very robust, and they can even take a fair amount of neglect and still be repairable. With halfway decent maintenance, there's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't last indefinitely. But if we go back and do the same exercise of looking at where the energy goes this time for a modern building, 
the differences quickly become clear. Raw materials are sourced from all over the world and are mined and harvested on a massive scale. Uh, processing rarely, if ever, takes place at harvest point, so the raw materials have to be transported, often to another country. Coming from Australia, I know that well. Processing generally takes a number of different stages, where the first is just transforming it into the basic material, steel, aluminium, cement, silicon, which is then transported elsewhere to be formed into a usable building material. Sometimes this means straight, sending it straight back to the country where it was first mined. And even this level of processing may not be the final stop on its journey. Uh, materials like float glass and aluminium and silicon may need to be brought together in yet another factory to make insulated glazing units, for example. And finally, the processed materials have to be transported to site, and then construction can begin. This involves many materials, a whole series of specialised rather than specialist trades and some pretty high powered equipment. And then finally we move into the cycle of keeping the constructed building in good condition. And just like a vernacular building, this means everyday tasks like window washing and specialist tasks like looking after the silicon steels and gaskets or cleaning the internal drainage channels. The running costs are significant because these are buildings designed to run on cheap energy. This is most office, uh, obvious in office buildings that, that have deep floor plates, which means you can't rely on sunlight for lighting and you can't open windows for ventilation. It's the office buildings too that meet with the most significant costs for regular refurbishment, which is in part a commercial imperative, but also a practical one because those silicon seals only last about 15 years or so. But the buildings aren't refurbished indefinitely. Sooner or later, most are just demolished, in which case you need to factor in the energy of demolition and disposing of the demolished materials, most of which can't be reused. And of course, you have to factor in the cost of uh, constructing the replacement, which means the whole cycle starts again. It's easy to see that construction accounts for much more of the energy input into modern buildings, not just office buildings, but also those houses in those places with their plastic and Tyvek lining uh, than it, it does for um, our older buildings, uh, which means, of course, that the intended lifespan of the building becomes even more important as a factor. And given that these buildings do get demolished, just how long is that lifespan expected to be? I don't know if you work in the City of London. If you do, you might know. It's probably even shorter than many of you are thinking. In the city of London, it's an average of 16 years, which is pretty shocking. This is just one of the reasons why I get cross when I hear people rabbiting on about the excessive use of energy in the historic built environment on the so-called inefficiency of the traditional buildings. That's not where the problem is. That's displacement activity. What's clear to all of us looking at the history of building is that far from being an energy problem, the historic environment is actually where we should be looking for some of the answers to our problems. And that's why I was so pleased to be asked to come and talk to you on the subject of how much archaeology might contribute to the combat climate change, because the answer is clearly massively. What archaeologists can do is to develop clear pictures for policymakers of how the building performance triangles looked in the past for the various types of building and for the various types of built community. A lot of the cutting edge work out there at the moment on things like local energy supply sounds to me very much like the way things were managed in the past. Archaeologists could give good solid inf evidence to support initiatives like local power generation and sharing, as well as all the detailed information about how the buildings themselves worked in the past. Even when we have a historic building that's cold and damp and isn't working for its occupants, it's generally because all the things that kept it working in the past have been lost, either by attrition or because they were removed deliberately, uh, especially as energy again became cheap. Uh, the shutters and draft curtains and wall panelling and tapestries and carpets and partitions, partitions in particular that all made it work, were pulled out as the energy became cheap. And the result does not necessarily lead to happy occupants, Then, especially when, they're in, uh, when they get their electricity bills. <laughs> 
then because uh, of the skills and knowledge of taking such a nosedive, we've lost the things like wide eaves and hood mouldings and exterior shutters and awnings that made the buildings work for their particular climates. So homeowners really, really need you building archaeologists to show them exactly how their little terrace, ha terrace house used to work, just as Jack was saying. It's not just aesthetics, but fundamental to helping people make the choices that will both cut their energy use and carbon output and produce better conditions for them inside the building, because it's actually really hard to think of any serious conflicts at that level. Planners really, really need you to suggest what might have been there when there aren't any clues left, that the building, given its location and its history and what's known about similar buildings, would almost certainly have had shutters, hood mouldings, cornices that might sensibly be replaced, even if not a pintel or a scrap of stucco now remains. Building researchers like me really, really need you to be teasing out what happened at the Industrial Revolution. What I'd really like to know more about is the induction, introduction of services and in particular the concealing of services and what impact this has had on building design and the way the buildings functioned. I'm thinking in terms of how building knowledge was gained in the past, which was largely by trial and error, because that's not the way it's happening now. It's mainly by changes in rules and regulations. And all you archaeologists that are interested in recent history and the impact on the recent built environment, what impact has that change had in practical terms? We also really, really need you to help us build up the picture of how communities used to function in energy terms and how they did what they did. And here I'm thinking of things like wind and water mills and communal bread ovens. I guess there's a fair bit there about the impact of the barter economy too. And although they might not realise that policy makers in government really, really need you to put forward your knowledge about the historic built environment in energy and carbon terms. We need to dispel the myth that the past was about discomfort and lack of control and give a balanced but more positive picture about how life operated in a world that didn't pin its existence onto fossil fuels and therefore practical f pictures of a functional alternative for our future. Uh, how do we find the information to back up those messages? And as Jack has already asked, how do we get those messages out to the wider world? So there's a couple of thorny questions for you to finish this conversation and get the discussion session, I hope, off to a bang. So over to Edward again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.